So we are um, completing our message series, Yes and Amen, and uh, it's so good that um, the worship team finally sang that song <laughs> on the last week of our message series. It's like, you know, you know the whole church is catching up with you when the, <laughs> when the pastor and the worship team are on the same. We're really big at orchestrating things here at Revival Life Church. We're super, super big on that. But we're finishing up our yes and amen. I hope hope you've gotten something out of this. Uh, I hope hope it's been good. I hope that you are more confident in the promises of God, and I hope you're uh, more resolute in standing uh, firm on them. You know, we live in troubling times. There's um, there's, There's no confusion about that. Now, I personally believe that the world is getting, watch this, better. I really believe that. How could Jesus be here for 2,000 years and things not get better? right? Like Jesus comes, things get better. Uh, Infant mortality rate is going down, right? Like like death in childbirth is going down. You don't want no coronavirus, but by and large, I mean, like things are better, right? However, at the same point, it seems like confusion is increasing. It seems like people can't even agree on what truth is these days or what an expert is or Listen to people who actually went to school for things, right? Anxiety seems to be at an all-time high in our society. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? I remember when I was young, people got stressed, but now people get anxiety from a young age. Even believers, it seems like, are constantly lacking direction. I get prayer requests from so many people who just say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what my next decision is. I don't know what my next step is. I just feel stuck. And as our planet is getting more and more populated, people feel more isolated than ever. People are getting more lonely as our lives are getting more busy. That doesn't make any sense. People are confused. People are confused even about God. And and if you feel confusion, I just want to speak this very quickly. God is not the author of confusion. He is not the author of confusion. But people are constantly asking me, Pastor, I'm not sure where I'm going. I'm not sure what the next step is. And faith is supposed to be a place of stability. But it seems that more and more people have infiltrated our faith and are using it for their own purposes, for their own gain, for their own plans. It seems that there was a time that faith was all about following Jesus, and now that's even been a little muddied. I don't know if you saw this statistic, but the Center for Disease and Control say that youth suicide rates have increased 58% over the last decade. That's crazy. We didn't used to get anxiety until we had to pay bills back in the day, right? Like life was simple. I was just watching Scooby-Doo, right? Life was easy. And now stress and anxiety comes early. And that's not God's design at all. I don't believe that's his plan at all, this confusion that the world feels. And we can look at the New Testament. And sometimes when we read the New Testament, we see that they were spending their lives spreading the gospel. They were spending their lives in ways that were affecting the world in a positive way. They were seeing people get saved all over the place. And they were making disciples everywhere. And and, and it can look like, you know, wow, these people kind of had it together. And, 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 if, and if we're not careful, we can say that the New Testament was just a history lesson, that this was just what they did to prove that the gospel is true. But that's, that's, that's not at all the correct narrative. The Bible is not just a history lesson. The Bible is, is truly uh, a book of possibilities. And it really needs to be the standard of what we can expect for our lives, a base level, if you were. I, I can't expect something less than the disciples had. I have the same spirit. I have the same Savior. And in fact, I have more teaching than they had. This generation is more educated than any generation of Christians ever. We have more access to resources than any Christians ever. The average believer today knows more Bible than most ministers did 1,500 years ago. And yet they push the faith forward. It would seem that with all our intellectualism and with all our knowledge, we've missed something. 
We've lost a piece that they had and seems to be slipping through our fingers. This book, this book of potential in God, it, how, do we, how do we bridge the gap between what they saw and what God has for us? How do we bridge the gap between the hope God has put in us and this reality in our lives? I am absolutely convinced that the Spirit of God does not give visions just so we can be spiritual. He does not give prophecies just so we can be called a prophet. He does not bring healing just so we can show people that we are anointed. But all of these gifts are the Spirit are supposed to point people to Jesus. And it is supposed to empower our lives to help people meet Jesus. Not complicated. Right? It's, it's not complicated. But the confusion that comes in complicates things that are supposed to be Simple. How do we bridge this gap between what the disciples saw and what we see now? Seems like they knew something that we have missed. And I contend and I would submit to you today, it's possible that they had a life of prayer. That they had a life of prayer. Time and again, as we read the scriptures, they sought God in the secret place and they prayed down heaven. But they didn't just pray down heaven to feel heaven. They didn't just pray down heaven to get wisdom and knowledge. They didn't just pray down heaven to show that they were anointed. They prayed down heaven and they got answers to questions. They got supernatural intervention in their problems. They got divine guidance. I, uh, <clears throat> I can be as susceptible as anyone to wanting spiritual experiences. We were created for spiritual experiences. We were created to be physical beings and spiritual beings. But how many of you know that not all spiritual things are good? And not all good things, watch this, are beneficial. I love me some steak, and I would encourage you all to eat steak. But even in steak, there's a limit. Even in steak, as hard as it is for me to say, there is a limit. And if we are going to get what they had, we're going to have to start doing what they did. We can't just get what we want of theirs without doing what they did. And we got a, we got a desire, watch this, to get out of this natural realm. We got a desire to like, earth can't be all there is. There's actually more. And we have to desire it, not just like, I don't need just spiritual things because I'm a spiritual being. Of course, there's spiritual things. I need what God has for me. And if we're going to break from the superficial to the supernatural, we're going to have to stop and pray. We're going to have to stop and pray. And this isn't some new concept that we made up in the New Testament. It's not just something that we do in the New Testament church. I mean, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 86.11, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Watch this. Unite my heart to fear your name. Now, this is super, super important. If you get anything out of today, I want you to really get this message. The psalm is saying, listen, I want to learn from you. And these supernatural experiences that we have are supposed to lead to us knowing him better, understanding his path more, getting divine guidance to what it is he wants us to do. If you have just pressed through into supernatural experiences, that's great, but you haven't arrived yet. We have to actually press in to receive from God the knowledge that he has for us. So watch this. He says, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I love this so much because I want this supernatural realm where God lives. God lives in the spirit realm, right? I want that supernatural realm to affect this natural realm. I want Boca Raton to look more like heaven. Amen. And I don't mean like with angels. I mean, I'm, I'm good with that. And I don't mean golden streets, although I'd be good with that too. What I mean is that we would have the ethic of heaven. That we would love like they do in heaven. That we would see no sickness like they don't see sickness in heaven. Like there's no confusion in heaven and that there would be no confusion here. That relationships 
like in heaven, would be eternal here. That we would love one another here. I want, I want, I want God's will to come in a way that affects my life. And the psalmist says that. He says, unite my heart to fear your name. Now, this, this fear, if you don't know, if you haven't been taught the Bible a lot, or maybe you were taught in a religious uh, tradition that really just wants you to be scared of God, that's not at all what he's talking about here. This fear that he's talking about is another word for reverence, that I would reverence your name. And what does that mean? That's a kind of a fancy word for understanding that God is not us. He is the other. And he's not beneath us, he's actually above us. He's actually the other above us. And yes, we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. However, Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. Jesus is completely separate from us. We're joined together with him through salvation, which is so awesome. But you and I will never be God. We're just never going to be God. And aren't you thankful Aren't you thankful that you don't have to be God over your situation? Aren't you thankful you don't have to fix your neighbor's marriage? You don't have to bridge the gap? You see, there's a gap between sin and God's will, and there's no way you or I can fill that gap. Only God can fill that gap. And this reverence that he wants to teach us keeps God in perspective in our lives. We get so familiar that we think, you know, Jesus is my homeboy. You know, Jesus is my girlfriend, like a lot of songs sound like these days. And, 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 and I believe that the love of God wants to flood your heart and be closer than the very air you're breathing right now. But yet and still, he's still the other. He's still holy. He's still worthy to be feared and reverenced. Our neighbors need to meet him. We do not need to be the perfect representation of the Father. Jesus all, was already that. We just need to let folks know where they can meet him. We don't have to be perfect, but we need to introduce them to the perfect one. And so he says, teach me to fear your name. See, we can trust God for our lives. We can trust God for our lives. We can trust God, hear me, for a godly mate. We can trust God for the future of our children. We can trust God for our finances. We could trust God for our lives. Because God has good plans for us. He has great plans for us. And the psalmist is saying, man, I want to line up with your great plans. There is something about lining up with people that brings something in our life. And when you line up with God, you begin to get the God stuff in your life. And so we need to be praying, God, help me to line up with your will. Help me to line up with your plans. Help me to line up with your truth. Amen. Come on, one class, we all clap. It's a good word, and God has it for your life. But the key to obtaining these promises is to hear and obey the voice of God. That's it. That's all we have to do is hear and obey the voice of God. It's that simple. And that's not a complicated thing because God has done everything that we need to bridge that gap. You see, religion says no. Religion says the way for you to live the right life is to know what to say no to. And Paul mocked this kind of religion. He says, oh, these people come and they say, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. But how many of you know you can avoid everything ungodly and still not become godly? You just live a life of religion. A life of religion. Jesus came saying yes. Yes to life, yes to prosperity, yes to joy, yes to freedom. Yes. And it's our heart that we would line up, as we called it a couple weeks ago, the divine yes. We want to line up with the divine yes. We spend our whole lives trying to figure out our own path, and Jesus is like, I've already made a way for you. All you have to do is line up with what I have said yes to. I don't know how many of you got saved later in life. I got saved later in life. And uh, I, I, uh, I have been in uh, relationships before, and I'm here to let you know, godly relationships are better than anything you can make on your own. There's so, amen. Amen. Saying yes to God's plan for your life is so much better. Listen, if, if you're listening to me now, chances are God's called you to something. 
And he's going to get you eventually. You might as well say yes now. Just say yes now. It makes life so easier. Listen, because God says yes, we say, say it, amen. amen. And that's our job to say amen to his yes. We don't have to develop our own plan. We just got to hear his plan and say amen. Amen to what he has for you. Amen to the joy, the life, the presence, the voice. Jesus made a promise to you that he is the way, the truth, and the life. We just have to follow him by his spirit. He made us just an amazing promise. He said, listen, I will not leave you as orphans. He said he would send his spirit and you would never be alone again. I will not leave you as orphans. I will send my spirit and I will be with you. He promises that he'll be with us by his spirit. Now, <clears throat> we just believe that in this church. We just believe that in this church. We just believe that the Holy Spirit of God will draw you into a dynamic, amazing, loving relationship with the Father. That's just what we believe, and we just see it time and time. Again, there's nothing greater than seeing somebody who didn't know the Father's love encounter His love, and your entire life gets changed. When His love comes in and invades your heart, everything changes. Who could say amen to that? We have to follow him by his spirit, though. See, <clears throat> forgive the reference, though. Too many believers are living life like we're in the movie Jumanji, right? We get dropped into a world that's foreign to us, and our entire life is trying to figure out a map we don't understand. That, that's not what you were called to. This is not what God has called you to. You don't have to figure this life out on your own. You were created to live a wild life life of faith. Amen. You can say whatever you want about the Christian life, but boring is not a word you can use. When you start following God and he starts giving you steps to take and paths to go down, you rarely know where those things are leading. The life of the Spirit is an exciting adventure. How many of you can say amen? It is a wild adventure. Now, sometimes that adventure feels like a first date that's filled with possibilities and exciting future ahead. And other times, that adventure feels like a roller coaster that was not very well maintained. And you're not sure if it's going to make it through this trip or not. But it's definitely an adventure. If you are bored with your life, Give it to Jesus. <laughs> Give it to Jesus. And hang on. <laughs> Keep your hands inside the ride at all times. Because we're called to this relationship where he just, where we just are one with one another and he just believes that we're going to trust him. See, this relationship that we're talking about, this place of relationship, is called prayer. This place of relationship is just called prayer. There was some um, there was a funny story, and who knows if it's true, but it's a preacher story, so I'm going to tell it. There was these three pastors. Someone just told it to me, and I think he made it up, but that's all right. And they began, you know, in this day and age, people like to have houses of prayer. And some people who have houses of prayer feel more spiritual, and so the pastor's like, hey, we start our, our house of prayer, and we're doing it every Tuesday night and every Thursday morning. And the pastor's like, man, that's amazing. I remember when that's where we were at. Now we pray five nights a week. And then the pastor's like, how about you guys? He goes, yeah, no, you, you guys got me. We just pray continuously. <laughs> <laughs> then that's what we're called to, amen? To be continually in the place of prayer in our heart with Jesus. You don't need people playing, strumming a guitar, we, we, like, we just stay connected to God. That's the, yeah. that's the place of prayer. I mean, it helps to have music, but I, you, you better not require it because in this roller coaster, there's dips and turns and loop-de-loops. <laughs> and it feels like a drunken attendant who's not awake at the wheel. Okay. 
here's the goal. So God wants us to live in this place of prayer where relationship is built, where relationship grows. You see, when you first meet somebody and you first get into relationship, there is a time of getting to know one another in a building of trust, right? Now, you know, when people are in middle school and they start dating and they fall in love, you remember middle school love, right? Middle school love where you can fall fully in love and devoted to somebody one week and the next week you don't talk to them because you don't like them because they're gross, right? And this is that immature love where you just throw everything in. And then after you've been dumb a couple times, you're like, I'm going to be in love on purpose next time. I'm going to wait before I give my entire heart to somebody because your heart had not been protected before, right? It had not been valued, it had not been covered, it had not been cared for. And so you get a little more wise. And I would submit to you, you don't really love until you love understanding that disappointment could come. Real love is saying, I know I could get hurt in this, yet you're worth the risk. Right now, if you're not whole, you're looking for love and you're constantly giving your heart away. You don't know how to protect it because you've not really received it, so you're still looking for it, right? Which is why people need the love of God. When you receive the love of God, now you say, okay, I know what love is. I don't actually need my love whole to be filled by another person because it's already been filled by God. Now I'm looking for somebody who understands what love is and can reciprocate. Amen. Amen. And so we have relationships so we can build trust. My marriage today is far from where it was in the beginning. There's so much more trust in there because we've been through the fire together, because we've been disappointed together, because we have failed and forgiven one another. There's a level of trust that was not there before. Fellas, let me give you some relationship goals, can you? Can I? We just celebrated our 20th anniversary. That's not the goal. Yes, amen. Thank you. That's not the goal. Here's where my wife and I are now. Like, we're really trying to watch our budget these days. So when we go out on our anniversary dinner, we exchange anniversary cards. And the way we do it is we go to a store, we find a card we really like, we take pictures of it, we put the $8 card back, and when we go on a date, we text it to each other, page by page. I could use that $20 somewhere else. I don't need to give that to Hallmark. <laughs> Fellas, if you've been married less than 10 years, buy the card. You're still building trust. You ain't there yet, bro. And all the ladies said, you ain't there yet. My wife is like, I would rather get my nails done than get cards. Can we just do that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what trust looks like, though. Like, I've already established that, right? And so we, we get in this relationship with Jesus. And we're trying to build trust with one another. This is what he's trying to do. And you don't have real relationship until trust breeds vulnerability. Can people be vulnerable around you? Listen, this is when you know you have a good relationship where you feel like you can be vulnerable and that's cared for and people can be vulnerable with you. Trust breeds vulnerability. And when this happens in your relationship with God, once you understand that failure is actually possible, that I could actually get it wrong, yet I choose to love and trust Anyway, it's in that level of relationship that we can really hear God. It's when we know, okay, I really can trust him. I've gotten it wrong, but I can trust him. He has me. My wife and I are at a place where we're far from perfect, but we're at a place now where we can be vulnerable with one another. And we can trust, like, this isn't going to define our relationship. Okay, <clears throat> has, has anybody, um, anybody heard of um, the term... Um, object permanence. It's, it's in child development, right? In small children, uh, it takes them months, but they develop what's called object permanence. That, that means 
they, they know that things are still there even if they can't see them. So that's why kids, they think peekaboo is such a funny game because they close their eyes and they don't know if it's going to be there when they open them. Because there's no guarantee what I'm... You've got to figure they were swimming at one point, and then there was a world, right? Like, so it's not totally irrational, right? And so you ever play with small children, and they think, like, when they close their eyes, the world goes dark? Like, I'm like, oh, turn on the lights. They're like, ha, ha, ha. And you're like, thank you. Because they don't understand that object permanence, that things are there even when you don't see them. And that takes a while. But hear me, it takes a while to develop spiritual object permanence as well. That, that's when like, we retain the identity of God and the reality that God is with me even when I don't feel Him. Like I've walked with Him long enough now that I may not feel Him in this season. I may not be hearing Him right now, but I know that He's still there. I know that He's still with me. And I know his plans are good. And this is, what, this is where we need to be going with God, that I don't need reassurance every five seconds that his plans for me haven't changed. He's not that fickle, and he's not that confused. <clears throat> this sense of God is with us, I, I, it's my greatest heart to leave a legacy of that. Now, I want to leave a financial legacy for my children, which probably excites them a lot, right? Like, I want to leave, I want to leave a legacy of a good name. Um, but more than anything, I want to leave a spiritual legacy with my children. And I am just convinced that one day, all of our graves will go unattended. At some point, people will stop visiting your grave. And that's impossible for us to believe because clearly, when I close my eyes, the world goes dark. And when my eyes are open, everything is light. But if I were to ask you in here today, how many of you have visited your great-grandparents' grave in the last couple months, probably not a whole lot of hands go up in the room. And maybe it won't happen a couple years. Maybe if you're just an amazing parent, it might take a few decades. But eventually, they will stop visiting your grave. And you will just be another name in a long line. You're like, well, pastor, that's kind of depressing. Well, it isn't because, number one, we're going to be living in heaven forever. But number two, right. number two, the legacy you live, you leave in the spirit for your children is going to be far greater than anything they write on that stone at your body. The Bible tells me that my children's children's children are affected by the decisions I make. That there is a spiritual legacy that I'm leaving my children. Now, if you're like me, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Maybe you did, and I bless you for that and your parents who raised you that way. But my wife and I were not raised in Christian homes. And because of that, we were trying to leave a legacy. So we made radical decisions early on about what it means to follow God. And later on, we told our kids, listen, we just we got saved as adults. And so we just we don't want nothing to do with Halloween because I don't know. I don't know how to discern what's what. And so we just said no to all of it. We didn't do Disney movies for a long time because I'm like, man, my family is called to leave a legacy in the spirit realm, and I don't want them confusing magic from the Holy Ghost of God. And you're like, well, that sounds religious. It was, but I didn't know anything else, and I'm like, well, if anything, we're going to err on the side of holiness. If I don't know, I'm just going to go with godliness, right? And so some things we were like, okay, now that you're 16, I know you're not worshiping, worshiping Beelzebub, so if you put on you know, a, a, an outfit, on late in October and hung out with your friends and ate candy, you're probably not going to get demonized. Other things were like, uh, 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 no, yeah, no, mm, not today, not tomorrow, not, not while you live with me, hopefully never, ever, never, no, right? Like, no, because we gain some level of discernment. We gain... <clears throat> so my children are going to, they're going to raise their kids in a household very different than the household they were raised in and vastly different than the household I was raised in. That's what we want, right? This is the kind of legacy we want to live. I want my children's children to live in a house that they assume that God is good and he's with them. Amen. This is what I want them to grow up knowing, that this my God, this living God is just one prayer away, and he loves me and has good plans for my life. This is, this is what I want them to walk away with. This is a greater legacy that you can leave than any money or any status 
or any job. Your prayer life will leave a legacy in ways that superficial measurements never will. If you ever tried to break uh, the cycle of poverty in your life, uh, I have, um, and we still fighting the good fight, amen? Like, we just get some momentum happening here. And you meet people. I remember when I first got saved, I have a buddy named Danny, and Danny's mom would pray. This woman prayed. She was interceding all the time, and it irritated me, the favor on Danny's life, who deserved none of that favor. (laughs) But stuff would work out for him, and finances came through for Danny, and Danny thought it was him. And I'm like, man, that's your mama praying down heaven. (laughs) Wouldn't you like your kids to get into school they're not qualified for? I would. (laughs) Loans that they shouldn't get, blessings and raises, right, jobs and positions and just favor with the city. That's the legacy I want to give. And the Bible tells me that I can expect that if I'll connect with God. God wants to build a place of trust so we can get real with him and hear his voice. That, that, that's kind of the goal here. In, in, in the story of the Exodus, which you all know, when the when the the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they went into the desert, right, and Moses led them out. As he led them out, God started giving some instructions according to the story of how they're supposed to build the temple. And everything had to go exactly according to God's plan, like down to the foot. If you read it, it's like he gives specific instructions on how to build the temple, how to build everything that goes in the temple. It wasn't just, you know, what color do you like? He gave them exact instructions. But only in one place did he tell them why they were supposed to build it. Watch this. Exodus 25, 8. He says, let them, watch this first, construct a sanctuary for me. Now, this sanctuary wasn't for man to come and get his sins forgiven. It wasn't for people to come. He said, it is for me, but why? That I may dwell among them. He wants to build an altar with you in him so he can come and dwell with you. That's always been his heart, that he would come and dwell, that you would build a place where he could come and dwell with you. Not visit, not pass by, to dwell. Amen. That's our heart for this church. Our heart for this church is to be a place that we can make room for the presence of God, that he would come and dwell with us. God cares, and he has the best in mind for you. Okay, I came across this crazy story in the Bible this week, and uh, I figured I got to tell this story, even if it has nothing to do with my message. And praise God, it has something to do with it, but this is wild. Are you ready for a wild story? All right, I'm going to tell it either way, because I, I got the microphone. Watch this. Okay, you heard of Elijah, yeah? Elijah was this amazing prophet who dealt with depression. If you deal with depression, don't, don't, don't beat yourself up. That's not helping, right? Be nice to you. Be nice, right? You're not helping by living under condemnation, by telling yourself that you shouldn't have it, right? You're not helping, right? Be nice to yourself. So Elijah had depression. Elijah was, you know, under great warfare, and uh, he had this battle with these false prophets, and they were all killed, and, and their, their leader, um, uh, Jezebel, was really mad that uh, they were all killed. And she said, you send a note to Elijah, and you tell him, just like you killed my prophets, today I'm going to kill you, right? And check this out, First Kings chapter 19, starting at verse 4, he says, but he himself, Elijah, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. Sounds like depression to me. How about you? I mean, if that, if that is not depression, that you're so close to God, you figure, I'll just ask him that I could die now. Like that's, amen. Are you with me? That's depression. He prayed that he would die. So watch this. And he prayed that he might die and said, it's enough, God. Anybody prayed that before? Enough, God, right? I told you this ride is exciting. 
Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And then he lay and slept under a broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Elijah was so depressed, but had such a relationship with God that God straight up sent an angel to bake a cake for him. Come on now. Come on, somebody. He baked a cake so he would feel better. Come on, somebody. Like, don't you ever want that? Like, I just want to die. I'm going to lay down and hopefully somebody got a cupcake for me when I get up. Wouldn't that make you happy to wake up to a cupcake when you're not feeling good? That's my God. Shows up with a cupcake for Elijah. I mean, he could have delivered him. He could have done all kinds of things. I know what I'll do. I'll send an angel to make him a cake. That's my God. How come I haven't gotten a cake? John 16, 24, until now you've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that, watch this, your joy may be full. God wants to, I mean, he may not make you a cake, but he wants your joy. Watch this. He didn't just want your joy to be full. He didn't just want you to be happy. Look, at there's a verb in there that your joy may be made full. Somebody else has to make it. He didn't say that you'll just be happy because you're like, okay, he wants me to be happy. I have to be happy now. Now, like being happy is a new thing you're failing at, right? No, he wants to make your joy full. That's God's plan for your life. Amen. Amen. And if there's anything our world needs right now, it's joy. We need it from God and the world needs to see it in us. God's placed hope on the inside of you and me, and he wants to bring it out. This is his desire. And we kicked off 2020 talking about our, our goal was to see God clearly, to see Jesus clearly. This is what we wanted, to see Jesus clearly. I don't want to see religion. I want to see Jesus. And this promise that we see more Jesus, see Jesus more clearly comes from him. And sometimes we feel like we need to get things worked out and we need to become better so that we'll see him and we'll hear him. And, and this, is, this is like, this is a plan of the enemy to keep us from really seeing him from seeking him, from going after him. makes us feel like we're not worthy of receiving his promises. And friend, if you've ever thought that way, like, I can't pray right now. I'm just, I have too much sin in my life. I can't pray right now. Like, I've messed up too much. You've already fallen into the, the plot of the enemy. You've already been trapped by the enemy because you never can make yourself good enough. You, you have fooled yourself. Now, listen, if you think that you can't come in to his presence and pray to him and talk to him because you've messed up, watch, watch this. That means that when he is in your presence, you've earned it. Then that means for those who aren't doing well, they deserve it. You see how this, no, that's all a lie. None of us deserve it. None of us have earned it. It's because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross that any of us could come into relation with him. And, and I just believe God delights when we call upon the name of Jesus and we enter into the presence of God because of what he did for us. Amen. Amen. I'm convinced. God's not looking for perfect. He's looking for humble. Amen. He's not looking for perfect. And sometimes when we get to the bottom and we're like, man, I don't deserve, I just, I can't. he's like, perfect. That's what I've been waiting for. You finally came to the end of you and when you get to the end of you, there he is. Now, sometimes for some of us, it takes some pretty messed up circumstances. Some, some people, it takes jail. It takes the hospital. Some people are fortunate enough that it just takes a friend saying, man, I know a better plan. Why don't you come with me where he is and you can meet him yourself? Not all of us were fortunate enough to have that person inviting us. And it takes us getting to the end of our self to meet him. We see in the Bible, in the New Testament, those who had a hard time receiving from Jesus it wasn't, it wasn't the sinners, it was the prideful. Jesus healed sinners all the time. It was the prideful he rejected. It was those who didn't think they needed him. And so God gave us power. He gave us power in our words. And again, why don't we use them to change our life? Why don't we use the power in our words to change our life? Look at this, 1 Corinthians 14, he says, what do we do then? He says, I will pray in the Spirit and I'll pray with my mind also. I'll sing in the Spirit. 
I'll sing with my mind also. Use your words that he's given you. And when you run out of English words, pray in your second language. And if you run out of Portuguese words, pray in some... And if you run out of words, pray in the Spirit. I don't know what I'm supposed to pray. Well, then you pray in the Holy Ghost. I have no idea, Duke, why this is some sort of a secondary thing these days. It's pretty clear in the Bible to me. Pray in the Holy Ghost. I feel like Jesus sent the Spirit for a reason. You don't think he was having a better time in heaven? (laughs) Jesus sent him so that he could be present with us. And we need to pray in the Spirit. And as we're praying in the Spirit, we need to be listening. We need to be listening. The real power in prayer is not speaking, but listening. The real power in prayer is listening. We need to be still before God to hear what He's telling us because that's where the real special sauce is. Not just that we can say to Him and make things happen, but that we get to hear Him. That's where the real special stuff happens. Not that we see someone has a problem, but we have heard a solution to their problem. That we not see that people are in sin, but we have heard how to help them get away out of sin. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, all you have is telling people what their problem is. But those of us with the Holy Ghost have a plan and a solution for the people's issues. That's what God has called us to. And what I have found is how we listen often determines what we hear. If we're listening for solutions, we hear solutions. If we're listening for someone to hear our complaints, then all we get is someone to complain to. God actually sent His Spirit to empower you to change this city to change this state, and to change our age. He sent you. He's not sending Jesus back to do it. He sent you, and he put his spirit on the inside of you so you can be the change agent in your world. That's a good word, Pastor. That's a good word. I believe the spirit is moving right now. There was a prophet, and he was getting it wrong in... uh, And God raised up a new prophet. And he couldn't hear God really well. His name was Samuel. And Samuel kept thinking that God wouldn't speak to him directly, but it must be his master. And finally, he went to his master, and he's like, I keep hearing you call me. And the prophet was smart enough to say, oh, no, no. This might be the call of God. God may be calling. And he taught him the most dangerous prayer, I think, in the Bible. We see it here in 1 Samuel chapter 3. And he prays it here. The Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, watch this. Speak, for your servant is listening. Speak, for your servant is listening. I just think God is calling so many people in this day and this hour to do amazing things for him. And the real question is, are we listening? Are we spending enough time to recognize his voice and listen? God has plans. He had plans for Samuel, just like he has plans for you. But Samuel didn't get to realize those plans until he listened. What is it God would have me do? Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. I think some of us have been calling, God has been calling some of us for a long time to him. God has been calling us to a new place to have solutions, but we've not recognized his voice we've not recognized it it's actually god that's called us to something bigger to something deeper to something better it's actually the call of god to more and i think god is waiting for an answer for some of us today let me tell you this if you're into spiritual things and you like mystical things it's a it's mystical and powerful and life-changing to make a declaration to follow Jesus. It, is, it changes everything. It changes generations. It changes your life. It changes your depression. It changes your pride. When you make a declaration, I am going to start following Jesus. Stand with me if you would. and We're just going to pray real quick. And I've already gone long, but I know um, there's people in this room today that God has been calling, and you feel this call. You feel this pull on your heart and you're not sure 
what it is. And even as I was talking today, you felt this feeling that you have had. And, and, and may I submit that I believe there's at least a few in this room and God is calling you to make a public declaration to Him that you're going to follow Him. To decide right now, just between you and Him, that you're just going to become a follower. That you're not just going to search, you're not just going to hear about Him, but you're actually going to follow Jesus. You're actually going to hear and obey the voice of God. And maybe you have been living your own life and maybe you haven't. Maybe you knew Him and you followed Him for a time and now, not so much. Maybe it's been a while since you followed Him. I want to give us an opportunity today, those under the sound of my voice, if, if you would just do me a favor, just close your eyes and bow your head. I, I know God isn't in hiding, but just for anonymity for a moment, for those of you, if you're in the sound of my voice today, and just between me and you, I just want to know who I'm praying for. I'm not going to call you out or make you uncomfortable in any way, but I believe the Holy Spirit is moving on some hearts right now, and He's challenging some of you that, yeah, it's time to be a follower, maybe again. It's time to follow God. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you want me to pray with you on this, between me and you, just put your hand up and down and say, Pastor, I'm ready. I want to be a follower today. Put your hand up and down. Yes, I want to be a follower. Yeah, who else? Anybody? I want to be a follower. Put it up and down. I want to pray with you. Second thing I want to pray with. Yeah, anyone else? Amen. Second thing. Maybe God has convicted you in the service that I, I, I need to get back to the place of prayer. I need to spend enough time to hear his voice and hear where he's calling me. I, I need to recommit myself. Maybe in this you're like, I know God has called me to more and I have just not taken enough time to hear what that is. Anybody in this room would say to me today, yeah, pastor, he's calling me to the place of prayer. Anybody? It's probably all of us, Yeah. Amen. Well, let's pray. First, let's pray those who want to give your life to Jesus. But let's all pray together, if we could. Uh, just repeat after me. And, and, and maybe this, you've done this a hundred times. Maybe it's the first time. Let's just pray this prayer together. We're just going to give our lives to Jesus. Say, Jesus, today I'm ready for the ride. I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sin and give me a fresh start. Fill me with your spirit. Give me power over sin. And give me power to be a witness. I'm ready to hear your voice and do what you say. And for all of us, we would say, Jesus, I'm ready to pray. Forgive me for neglecting it. Draw me back to the place of prayer. Draw me back to you so I can follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Sorry. God bless you guys. Woo. Um, if you prayed that prayer today to give your life to Jesus, um, we would just ask you to fill out a connection card. You can either bring it up to the front or bring it to the lobby and um, so we can just pray with you. And um, I also want to remind you guys, you know, God is moving here. People are coming to Jesus and, and being encouraged by the message, right? And so we just want to give you the opportunity to invite people to church. We have invitation cards at the table in the back and also in the lobby. And um, we just want to bless you guys. Have a great week. Have some great prayer time hearing God. And uh, we love you guys. Amen.